Okay, so welcome back to Social Studies. We are on Chapter 8, Lesson 1. We are on page 205. We started this the other day. Um, the Geography of New England. Page 205. Let's look at the box first. It says... Um, the dates in the dates after the names of most New England colonies are the years they were founded. Which colony was claimed by both New Hampshire and New York? Who knows which one was claimed by New Hampshire and New York? Vermont it is. Good job. Which colonies were founded after 1630? After 1630. New Hampshire was founded in 1680. Connecticut was founded in 1636. Rhode Island was founded in 1636, right? So the only one, the oldest one, the oldest colony is New Hampshire, or is Massachusetts, which is 1630. And that's where the pilgrims settled first, right? They came to Massachusetts. All right, so the geography of New England. At first, life in Massachusetts Bay Colony was hard. Much of the land is hilly. Do we have a lot of hills in our grass in our county? No. no. The soil is also thin and rocky. You'll find a lot of times thin and rocky soil is is uh, close to the coast. These conditions made farming difficult. Still, the area had many other natural resources that the Puritans. Remember, the Pilgrims came first, and then it was the Puritans that the Puritans needed to survive. The forest supplied the colonists with wood to make homes, fences, and tools. The Charles River as well as the Atlantic Ocean also provided many kinds of fish. New England had much to offer its colonists. Um, I don't know. Do we see the Charles River in here? I don't really see the Charles River in here. Um, but like I said, notice all of this is Atlantic Ocean. This is all the coastline, and there was a ton of fish in there originally. We've really fished a lot of the, the fish out of the Atlantic Ocean, and there's now limits on how much you can take. But back in the day, there was a ton of fish there. This is the Duxbury, Massachusetts home of John and Priscilla Alden. They and other New Englanders moved to Duxbury in the late 1620s. So, John Alden House, 16, I think it's third, is it 33 or 53? Having trouble seeing on the angle. I think it's 33. Um, so, this is a pretty old house. But, you know, think about this. 1733, 1833, 1933, 2033 would be 400 years old. So we're pretty close to 2033. I mean, we're like 10 years lacking, 400 years old. So that's pretty good if it's survived for 400 years almost. I don't know. I can't quite... See it from the angle. Oh, sorry. Still, it's it's still like 30 years away from being 400 years old. Sorry, I told you I couldn't quite tell from the angle. All right, so let's turn at the next page. A city upon a hill. This is a big deal. This is a really big deal. A Pur the Puritans wanted to create a colony that would be the model for all the world to see and follow. John Winthrop used words from the Bible to describe their colony as a city upon a hill. Remember, the reason they wanted to come to the United States was because they wanted religious freedom. 
They wanted the right to choose how they got to worship. Um, so they wanted religious freedom, so they... Um, so the things that they thought, the things that they looked at, it all went through the filter of um, their religion. And so they wanted a city on a hill. In many ways, their dreams came. Tr their dream came true. Massachusetts Bay Colony began with about 700 people in 1630. Ten years later, the population had grown to over 20,000. So... 10 years within 10 years you go from 700 to 20,000 that's a huge leap that's a huge leap they gained like 19,300 people in 10 years that's a lot of people um the mass uh, massachusetts bay had one of the largest populations of any european colony in north america at that time the puritan way of life and the puritan community each Free man, as a male colonist was called, signed a covenant. A covenant is a special promise or an agreement. Each free man promised that his family would live by the rules of the Puritan church. The Puritans believed that success of their colony was the result of their belief in God and the Bible. They also believed in hard work this meant that everyone rich and poor alike had to help build the community the puritans built their villages according to a plan you can see the diagram of a new england village of the middle of the middle 1600s on the next page in the center of each village was a meeting house and the village common. Remember, we put this in your notebook last on, on Tuesday, right? Um, in earlier villages, the meeting houses also served as the church. Education was important to the Puritans. They believed that people should be able to read the Bible. The Puritans built schools that were free to all the children of the community. Free education was unheard of in Europe at that time. To imagine what school was like then, read the excerpt from the Puritan school book. How does it compare to those of today? So this is many voices. This is a primary source, so it goes all the way back to the 1600s. So this is what they would have read. Excerpt from a New England primer, a school book first published in 1689. The, for the Puritan children, A, in Adam's fall, we sinned all. B, the, thy life to mend, this book attend. C, the cat doth play, and after slay. D, a dog will bite, a thief at night. E, an eagle's flight is out of sight. F, the idle fool is whipped at school. Can we whip you today? No. Oh no. You would get in, I would get in big trouble. Now there are last I knew states in the United States you can spank a kid. When my cousin moved from Michigan down to Tennessee, his mom signed a note saying that the principal could spank him. Oh. Now, do I know that that's the rule still today? No, but I do know that my cousin was able to be spanked by the principal when he moved down to Tennessee from Michigan because his mom signed the note. Would you do that? I don't know if it's still the law there today, but I know that when he went to school, that was the law because he told me stories about getting spanked by the principal. Did he tell him that, that did it hurt? No. We well, never know. I think he, I think they were I think they got paddled, but I'm not positive. Like a board. All right. Um. So we'll look at this in just a minute. This is the colonial students learned to read using a horn book. It's a page under clear horn. 
So think about the horn that your that your steer might have or a horn that um, might be on a goat or something. So what they would do is they would take the horn and they would make a really thin, clear coating, kind of like our plastic or something today. And instead of having plastic, because plastic is man-made out of oil, they use something that's a little bit more natural. So if you cut horn slim enough, you can read through it, but it protects the thing that's underneath. Does that make sense? Yes, no, maybe so. So in our, our notebooks on page 10, we just glued in about school. It says, in the earliest days of colonial America, parents taught children at home. So think about back to COVID. How nice was it for your parents to be able to teach you? Or was it really hard? All right. So uh, in, the, in the earliest days of colonial America, parents taught children at home. To some families, it was more valuable for children to learn to farm rather than read. Going to school only took able workers, the children, away from the fields. For other families, both school education and farm education were equally important. Formal education was especially important. Formal education was especially important in the New England colonies. Most Puritans were educated people and they wanted their young to be too. Parents usually educated young boys and girls at home. Often a woman in the village taught several young children in her home. These schools were called dame schools. The young children learned how to read and write. So dame schools were a young lady taught several kids in her home. When the children got a little older, some children attended schools taught by men called schoolmasters. A woman who taught in a school had to quit teaching when she married. The schoolmasters were very strict, and students were punished harshly for disobedience. Students were expected to have perfect manners. On a typical school day, children sat on long wooden benches completing assignments in math and grammar. Grammars like English. Students studied a book called the New England Primer, which was first published in 1690, which helped children learn the alphabet with a series of short rhymes. I think that might be the ones we just... Well, this was a horn book, but it's probably similar to that. In Adam's Fall, we, we send all kind of short rhymes. Um... One other book that was part of, the good part of a good education was the Bible. After a few years of basic education, formal school ended for most children. Boys learned a trade from their families or through an apprenticeship. So a trade would be like, um, back in the day they didn't have schools to teach you how to make shoes. So you would go to the cobbler and learn with the cobbler how to make shoes so that people had shoes to wear. Um, it would be like, I'm learning how to use the printing press, so I would go to the printer and learn how to print things from the printer. Not, no, you would learn how to make shoes through an apprentice. You would be an apprentice to somebody, so you would be a learner. Does that make sense? kind of like um, if I was learning how to be a plumber today, that's like a trade. I would go to a trade school or I would learn from somebody who's already a plumber. Um, sons of rich families or through an apprentice, sons of rich families attended colleges. So only rich people attended college back in the day. Girls learned household skills from their mothers. Daughters of rich families were sent off to finishing schools where they learned music, painting, and foreign language. Massachusetts passed a law in 1642 
that parents had to teach their children to read. Another law was passed in 1647 that towns with 50 or more families had to have a school teacher whose salary was paid by the town inhabitants, even those who had no children. So today, your education is because the people of Gratiot County, or specifically your school district, whether they have children in the school district or not, have to pay for your education. Part of their tax money pays for your education. And that started back in Massachusetts in 1647. This was the start of public school system in America in which every child can be educated no matter how much money that their family has. Now, I'll be honest with you. There are still some countries today who they have to pay to go to school and they have to pay for their uniforms to go to school. Yeah, some places, some countries, you have to pay for the uniform. If you cannot afford a uniform and you cannot afford the books and the cost, uniform, you don't get to go to school. And a lot of times, families choose to send their boys to school before they choose to send their girls to school. So think about that if you're a girl. They choose to send their boys to school, and they choose to keep their girls home. School fast facts. Boys who talked to their friends in school were given the whispering stick. A whispering stick was a small tree branch that was placed in the boy's mouth to keep him quiet. So if you were a regular talker, I might give you a popsicle stick, and you'd have to keep it in your mouth so you didn't talk. Oh, no. My, I'm gonna, my mouth is going to be gone. When do you get out? What? When do you get out? Probably at lunchtime. No, what if, what if he saw you took it out? Remember, they, they beat people. They whipped people. They spanked people. There were harsh punishments. And it wasn't just you got a harsh punishment in school. If your family found out you embarrassed them at school, you went home and you got another spanking uh, or a whipping or go. something. Shh. Now, am I saying that that's okay? No, but I am saying that that's what happened. You know, if I would have gotten in trouble in school, I would have gone home and I would have been a big whoopee at home. Some people get in big trouble at home and some people not so much. Um, it was more important for children to have perfect penmanship than to spell correctly. Some rich boys were sent to college in England by the time they were 11 years old. No, that's okay, your age. In 1635, the first public school in the colonies opened in Boston, Boston, Massachusetts. In 1636, Harvard College was founded in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Harvard, I think, is the oldest college in the entire country. Yeah, it's an Ivy League. Mm -hmm. It's hard to get into? Yes. A lot of people want to go, and they have a ton of applications and only so many spots. You have to be on the ball to get into Harvard. By the time of the American Revolution, there were colleges in many other colonies, including William and Mary in Virginia, Yale, which is in Connecticut, Princeton, which is in New Jersey, Columbia, which is in New York, and Brown University, which is in Rhode Island. In 1861, Pennsylvania founder William Penn said that children in his colony must learn the three R's. Reading, writing, and arithmetic. Or reading, writing, and arithmetic. One rule in this school of good manners was stuff not thy mouth so as to fill thy cheeks. So in other words, you shouldn't probably put a big piece of chocolate in your mouth so your cheeks go like this. And then it says, be content with smaller mouthfuls. Has that rule lasted to the present? Do we still have to eat smaller bites, or do we still we jam a bunch of food in our mouth? Jam a bunch of food in our mouth. All right, I have, I have two more pages, and then we got to go back to the book, and then I'll give you your assignment. 
This is a horn book. So we talked about the horn book. This is kind of what it looks like. In colonial times, paper was scarce. Scarce means it was really hard to get paper. And it was expensive. Most students did not have textbooks. So your social studies books, most people wouldn't get one of those. That's a textbook. The main learning tool was the horn book. The horn book was invented to protect the paper on which the children's lessons were printed. The horn book was a flat board with a handle. A piece of paper with information on it was pasted to the board, kind of like your glue stick. The lessons usually contained letter combinations, Roman numerals, and the Lord's Prayer. The board was covered with a piece of cattle horn, so it was horn from a cow, cattle, cut so thin that the lessons could be read through it. The handles of horn books had a hole drilled in them through which a cord could be strung. Colonial students often wore their horn book around their necks, so it was handy for lessons. So here's the hole. They would put a, a piece of cord through there, put it around their neck so that they have it when, when they go to school. They yep, when they need it. Daily writing and penmanship were important in colonial schools. Pencils were expensive. So most students had to write using a quill pen. You're lucky you get an eraser, I'm not going to lie. The pens were made from goose or turkey feathers. Now mine is not a goose or turkey feather. One year we went to um, the Historical Museum. Mr. Kemmler gave me a goose or turkey feather. Mr. Kemmler has geese and turkeys on his hey, property. Teacher, sorry for the interruption. Okay, so um, the quills were sharpened with a knife to make a point. Students dipped their quill pens in the bottle of ink continually as they wrote. You're going to have to wait just a minute. Students had to copy the alphabet and sentences over and over again until the teacher was happy with their penmanship. Young students were allowed to use the lined paper to practice, but older students were expected to write neatly and straight on unlined paper. The ink was messy, so after the students finished writing, they had to use a blotter paper to soak up the excess ink. So what I want you to do for the next couple seconds, I want you to see if you can trace one of those letters with your pencil. Yep. Okay, so this is what a New England village looked like in the 1630s to the 1650s. Notice, this was the common area. This was the village green. This is where their sheep graze, their cattle graze, that kind of thing. This is the stocks. Now you can't really see really well, but if you did something inappropriate, what they would do is they would put your arms in two spots and your head would go in the middle and they would lock your head and arms down. And then what would happen is People were like mad at you that throw rotten vegetables at you. They could throw rotten tomatoes at you. They could toss whatever they wanted at you. It was a punishment. So let's see, I'm walking down the road. Do, 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 do. And I'm like, oh, there's that person from my next door neighbor. And he's been really mean to me. And he's in the sex. I'm going to go home and get some smelly stuff. And I'm going to throw it at him. And you're just stuck there. If your hands are stuck in the stocks and your head's stuck in the stocks, you get to say, no thanks. No. no, you're stuck. They can do whatever. They can throw whatever they want at you. What are you thinking? Are you thinking the guillotine? Yeah, so, well, this is, this is the stocks. The guillotine was something that was in France, and it took your head off. We're not, we're not talking about France. We're talking about New England. So this is the shoemaker's house. We had a shoemaker's house. This is the barrel maker. Um, obviously, they made barrels. The barrels, they stored food in. They might store sugar in. They stored food products in. 
The blacksmith um, shoes your horses. Um, made anything metal related. Like I said, the common ground is where you um, grazed your animals. Uh, well is where you drank. So you'd have to go to the well, pull up the water you needed for the day, and take it home. If you ran out of water, usually it was probably a kid's job to go get more water from the well. The inn, inn is exactly what we kind of think of it today. People that are visiting would stay. Um, this is the minister's house. The mill, the mill's a pretty big deal. We tend to think of mills as like, like a sawmill, but they also had grist mills, mills that would grind your food. So that you would put flour grains on it and it would grind your grains of flour, in, it, grains into flour. Or it would gr grind your corn into cornmeal. That's how you got your flour. You would take it to the mill. And you would pay the person who owned the mill to grind up your food so, or grind up your cornmeal or something so that you could have food. So you would pay them. And a lot of times you weren't necessarily paying them in money. You were trading. Oh, Mr. Mill owner, I'm the cobbler. I will make you a pair of shoes if you'll grind all my corn this year. You did a lot of trading. Yeah, there was some money, but a lot of it was trading. Um, the woodlot <clears throat> um, fields, obviously, where you uh, planted your crops. This would be school where you'd be hanging out at today. Uh, meeting house is where... Um, small school. Yeah, it was a small school. Um, but again, you know, they guaranteed the kids got to go to school, um, which is a pretty big deal. All right, go ahead and turn the page. New England grows. Uh, no, not right now. At first, the Puritans lived in and around Boston. Soon they started new colonies in the region. Some of these colonies were founded as a result of religious disagreements between the Puritans and their leaders. <clears throat> Puritans speak out. Puritan leaders wanted everyone in the community to share their beliefs. They wanted everybody to be the same. They wanted them all to believe the same. One Puritan who disagreed with them was the minister, Roger Williams. Williams believed that the colony needed to tolerate or allow different religious beliefs. To tolerate means to allow people to have beliefs different from your own. That's kind of like with Mr. DeRosia, right? If Mr. DeRo Mr. DeRosia does not just get to have U of M fans in his classroom, does he? That means if, if you like state, Mr. DeRosia has to tolerate having you in class. He can't yeah. say, so sorry, dude. Out the door, you like state. I just like U of M, yeah. right? He can't say that. So that's tolerate, except we're talking football or basketball or that kind of thing, and they're talking about tolerating religion. Okay, tolerate. I'd be allowed in. Well, but Mr. DeRosia, again, has to tolerate people who like state. He's not allowed to only teach the U of M fans. All right, tolerate different religious beliefs. To tolerate means to allow people to have beliefs different from your own. Anne Hutchinson was another Puritan who disagreed with the leaders. She believed people should pray directly to God rather than depend upon the church teachings. John Winthrop described her as a woman of active spirits, more bold than a man. Both Williams and Hutchinson were brought to trial. Trial is jail. Like no, as in, if you're guilty, you could go to jail kind of thing. Let's see what happens. They're both brought to trial. Puritan leaders tried to convince Williams to change his views. Do you think we can get Mr. DeRosia to not like Michigan? No. That's going to be hard. I think it would be really hard. Now... All right. 
Um, instead, Williams fled Massachusetts in 1636. He founded the settlement of Providence in what became Rhode Island. So Williams is like, nope, sorry. I'm never going to like state. I'm just going to leave your state and go find my own state so that I can like U of M. Right? So, so now obviously it's not U of M. In this case, it's a religion. Right? So... And, and Rhode Island was the first European colony in the Americas to allow the freedom of religion. So if you went to Rhode Island, you could say, oh, well, I like State and U of M. Or you could say, well, I like Ohio State and U of M, and I like all the games. That's what my brother-in-law does. He likes all the games. He watches all the games, probably like you. Do you wa do you watch all the games? Yes. State or Michigan? Uh, no, like as in he watches all the games, like football, oh. basketball, baseball, oh, softball, well, I all of them. Thankfully, he doesn't text me anymore. He used to text my mom, well, Michigan is playing against blah, 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 and they're playing blah, 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 yeah. and blah, 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 blah. That's what he used to text all the time. Um... After her trial, Anne Hutchinson was forced to leave Massachusetts. So she didn't get a choice. Williams decided to leave. Anne, Hutch Anne Hutchins had to leave. This is what they said. In 1638, she traveled south to Rhode Island. Her family and supporters started a settle the settlement of Portsmouth. So Anne Hutchinson, not only she was forced to leave, but her family and friends went with her. Another Puritan minister, Thomas Hooker, also left Massachusetts. Hooker believed that each church should be independent and should choose its own leaders. In 1636, he and about 100 followers founded the colony of Connecticut. Rhode Island was founded because somebody didn't like somebody else's religion. Connecticut was founded so somebody because they didn't agree with the religion. So three, three states were founded because of religious beliefs. Changes for the Native Americans. As, for, as the New England colonies grew, the Native Americans lost their land. Oh, this is a picture of John Winthrop above. He was the governor of Massachusetts. He disagreed with colonists such as Anne Hutchinson. This is Anne Hutchinson at the right. Um... As the New England colonies grew, the Native Americans lost their land. At first, some Native Americans helped the colonists. When Roger Williams fled Massachusetts, for example, the Nargisset allowed him to live on their land. In turn, Williams paid them for land on Nargisset Bay, where he started his colony. So Williams paid for the land. As the colonists settled more and more land, disagreements arose with the Native Americans. In what later became the Connecticut colony, bitter fighting broke out between the Pequot and the English colonists. In the Pequot War of 1637, as the fighting was called, hundreds of the Pequot and the colonists were killed. Hundreds were killed. That's a lot. Um... After the Pequot War, there was no fighting between colonists and Native Americans for almost 40 years. So they didn't fight for almost 40 years. During that time, colonists moved to what is now New Hampshire. They also moved to regions that later became the colonies of Vermont and Maine. Up here, this is Matacomet, wanted to force the colonists out of New England. He had very different perspective on the English than his father, Massasoit, who helped the pilgrims. So Massasoit helped. Metacomet wants him out of there. So here's Metacomet. By 1675... By 1675, the Wampanoag leader, Metacomet whom the English called King Philip, so Metacomet was called King Philip, was preparing to fight to keep the Wampanoag lands. 
many Native Americans joined Meta Comet, including the Nargisset. Years earlier, Mega Comet's father, Massazoit, had helped the pilgrims. King Philip's war, as the struggle was called, was fierce. In Massachusetts alone, Native Americans destroyed 16 towns. What is it that they called? Is it a city or a town? I think it is a city, but think about this. 16. 16 of them were destroyed. In 1676, Meta Comet was captured and killed. His family was sold into slavery in the West Indies. This defeat marked the end of, end of the strong Native American resistance in New England. Why it matters. The way of life that the Puritans brought to New England can still be seen as you travel through its many towns and small villages. Some Puritan ideas also continue to affect life in the United States. Part of our country's system of public education was modeled after the Puritan schools. Main ideas. The Puritans, led by John Winthrop, arrived in New England and founded the settlement of Boston in 1630. Roger Williams founded Providence in 1636, the first settlement in Rhode Island. In 1638, Anne Hutchinson founded Portsmouth, also in Rhode Island. Connecticut was founded in 1636 by Thomas Hooker. The Wampanoag, Wampanoag leader, Meta Comet, led King Philip's war against the English in 1675. His defeat ended most Native American resistance to the colonists of New England. Now, you got this worksheet the other day. You are responsible for number one. Um, you will be responsible for number two. And now number three. three. And four? No four? There's no four. Just one, two, and three. Any questions for me?